నేను సేల్స్ సేల్స్ రాలేదు వెరీ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ మై డియర్ ఫ్రెండ్స్ గుడ్ టు సీ యూ ఆల్ వెల్ దిస్ శివ తేజ హియర్ ఐ క్వాలిఫైడ్ చార్ట్ అకౌంట్ అండ్ కాస్ట్ అకౌంటెంట్ వెల్ ఐమ్ హియర్ విత్ యూ గైస్ టు స్పెండ్ సమ్ అమేజింగ్ టైమ్ విత్ యూ ఆన్ డిస్కషన్ అబౌట్ సమ్ వండర్ఫుల్ ఏరియా విచ్ వీ ఆల్ నో దాట్ ఈస్ నన్ అదర్ దాన్ జిఎస్టి దాట్ ఈస్ గూడ్స్ అండ్ సర్వీసెస్ ట్యాక్స్ అండ్ దర్ ఇస్ స్పాల్ అప్రెన్షన్ విత్ స్టూడెంట్స్ కీప్ థింకింగ్ దాట్ ఇట్ ఇస్ గూడ్స్ అండ్ సర్వీస్ ట్యాక్స్ let me first tell you and clarify my dear friends it is goods and services tax one such wonderful area where there is a terrific scope of work and terrific practical importance at the same time very much amount of examination importance for both ips as well as final students and let me make it very very clear my dear friends when it comes to ips students as well as final students for both of them gst is applicable there is no old act which is applicable of course for finance students there is gst also at the same time customs act also that is for finance students there is gst for 75 marks and customs for 25 marks but for ips students 50 marks is as usual the direct tax part and the other 50 marks which was earlier service tax vat customs and all is now completely replaced with gst and in terms of new syllabus students that is ca intermediate for you people it is 60 marks direct taxes and 40 marks is for gst and for of course old syllabus it is 50 marks direct tax 50 marks gst and ca for students 75 marks gst and 25 marks customs in light of all these parameters the straight concept is very very clear that the topics of gst for ipcc and final are very much similar of course there are some very much more interesting topics at ca final level and more number of topics at cf and level but some lovely topics are there which are common for ipcc as well as final topics like registration topics like valuation topics like time of supply these are all very very common something topic like tax invoice debit note credit note these topics are common for both ipcc as well as final students but when it comes specifically for ca final students there are some more special and wonderful topics like place of supply and some more interesting areas like refunds and some areas like advance ruling some areas like penalties and prosecution some miscellaneous provision and one more great area called transitional provisions that is what is going to happen and uh, how wonderfully and how smoothly we have shifted from our old laws to gst laws and what is the forms we have filed and what is it we have done exactly when we shifted from old law to gst and we all know my dear friends something really wonderful that gst is such a quite new law which is a newborn baby not even one year for the baby to start it off it started off on 1st of july 2017 which is so wonderful and so fantastic which replaced all the old taxes with a great slogan of one nation one tax such a lovely wonderful act it is which has some terrific points and some beautiful points where ica has some good cream of questions what they can make and lovely questions what they can ask and i keep getting a lot of question on the students many a times sir first time we are writing gst in the exam how is it going to be what is it going to be what kind of questions are going to come in the exam what kind of pattern it is going to be and at the same time how is icai going to ask and when student call me and ask sir it's cf and student will they ask multiple choice questions how is that they are going to ask in the exam and what kinds of questions can come up and how do we answer the questions and everything looks so small 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 if write that small answer will that small answer be sh- sufficient for us to score the marks 
So like this, there are so many apprehensions among the students as to how do we tackle and answer the GST in the exam. Well, friends, Shivadeja is here with all the answers for your questions, what you have. Feel free to drop all the questions, what you have. Just keep commenting your questions. I'm here to answer all your queries. Until the time all your queries are done, I'm not going to leave this place. I'll answer all your queries, discuss everything with you and keep posting all your queries and comments, whatever you have. But of course, at the same time, I'll discuss some lot of wonderful and lovely topics with you. So for that reason, when I'm discussing some topic, I'll complete that topic first and then I'll get back to the comments. Let's discuss, keep asking that comments and your queries. Then again, I'll get back to subject and again, we'll get back to the comments. We'll keep flipping between both of them so that we'll not miss the subject in between. So let's do that effectively and do it wonderfully. Yeah, thank you. So friends, moving on. When I talk about this GST goods and services tax, we have areas like the basic concepts. We have areas like charge of GST, which is dealt by your lovely section called Section 9 of CGST Act and of course Section 5 of IGST Act. And we also have some lovely topic called composition scheme. And we have five wonderful areas in your GST that is your valuation, time of supply, place of supply, time of supply, place of supply, valuation, registration and also topic like input tax credit. These five areas are such a wonderful crux of GST law that is your, I repeat again, your valuation, your input tax credit, time of supply place of supply and registration. These five topics are so wonderful areas where there's going to be some terrific importance and focus on the exam also. And if you have seen the RTP also, even in your revision test paper also, there are some good questions on this particular topic which have come up in the exam. So that clearly indicates that in the longer run, when I go to write the exam very soon in next month, there is definitely be a good number of questions on this particular areas. And of course, at IPC level, the level of coverage is less. And CFN level, the level of coverage is high in terms of the level of topic and in terms also in terms of number of topics. Yeah. So let's move on and go topic wise and discuss some wonderful areas in every topic. And I'll also highlight to you what are the important areas where focus should be and in what way the questions can come in the exam and how do we need to answer that so that we can have some effective discussion over here. Yeah. And hi to everybody who have commented. Hi. Good to see all your comments. Hi guys. Hi friends. Everyone. Please keep commenting any of your queries, what you have. I'll be happy to answer all of your queries, including the exam pattern and the presentation too. Yeah, right. Thank you. So friends, moving on to the first discussion, guys. When I talk about this GST, guys, we all know that GST stands for goods and services tax. And first of all, the basic important parameter of what we all need to know is that there are the most important essence of GST law. It lies in that one word called supply. See, earlier it was so very common for all of us to say that when we talk about goods, we always used to tell sale of goods and services we used to tell providing services. But under GST law, there is nothing called sale of goods, nothing called providing service. The only one word is called supply, which is defined by section 7 of CGST Act. Which section guys? Section 7 of CGST Act defines exactly what does this word supply means. And some crazy point and important point what you all need to get answer, get some very good clarity under GST law is something like this. See, we always have a point of thought process that, see for example, I have a head office and a person also has a branch office. We always have a thought process that head office and branch both are one and the same. It's just only an extension of our undertaking where there is no separate entity as such. But under GST law, the perception is altogether different and the way it runs is totally, totally different. When I say the way is totally different, what is that I really want to tell you guys is something like this. See, under GST law, we are all we are required to take registration under GST. Every businessman is required to get registered under GST and required to pay GST if the aggregate turnover exceeds something known as 20 lakhs. I repeat again, if the aggregate turnover exceeds 20 lakhs, registration is mandatory. And if there is, if there is a taxable turnover in special category states, in what states? Special category states, the registration is required if the aggregate turnover exceeds 10 lakhs. It's not 20 lakhs, it will be 10 lakhs. But let's get some good clarity on this point that is very clear that registration is required only if the aggregate turnover is more than 20 lakhs in normal states and in special category states the limit is 10 lakhs. 
and its special cardiac state basically covers a northeastern state like assam manipur meghalaya mizoram nagaland kohima all these kind of places are basically covered in your special category states and uh, himachal pradesh also comes in this category and when i say this limit of 20 lakhs 10 lakhs the first basic fundamental point we need to get is that registration is required only when the aggregate turnover exceeds 20 lakhs this word aggregate turnover is such an important word which we need to get because this word aggregate turnover is defined by one section called section 26 26 of cgst act defines what is exactly this word called aggregate turnover means where they clearly say that aggregate turnover covers both taxable supplies as well as exempt supplies as well as interstate supplies even the exports also covered there but one some crazy point we need to get is that exempt supply is covered by and defined by section 247 which says that exempt supply also covers non taxable supply and non taxable supply is defined by section 278 which says non taxable supply also covers supplies which are not covered in gst law and i'm sure most of us who are watching this video and there anywhere you guys know very clearly that gst is applicable on supply of all goods and services except supply of your alcoholic liquor for human consumption except that gst is applicable on every product and every service except for alcohol liquor for human consumption so with that reason that's very clear that alcohol is not covered in gst so far so now take situation like this imagine a question like this that is a person is operating in telangana also telangana state for a second the second example that he is operating in telangana state and is also operating in let's say us let's say for a second uh, he is operating in telangana state also operating in sikkim state in telangana he has a hotel sikkim also has a hotel telangana taxable turnover is about 14 lakh rupees 14 lakhs i repeat again telangana taxable turnover is about 14 lakhs and in sikkim there is a turnover of alcohol of 4 lakh rupees so effectively aggregate turnover is turning out to be 14 plus 4 that's your 18 lakhs our mindset very clearly says to us that the moment it is 18 lakhs my dear friend let's answer in the exam and just write that 18 lakhs registration is required because our aggregate turnover has crossed 10 lakhs because we have operations in special category state that is sikkim but absolutely my dear friends the answer is wrong because of the fact that aggregate turnover covers exactly aggregate turnover covers taxable supply exempt supply even non taxable supply but if that aggregate turnover is more than 20 lakhs registration is required but if you recall what i told 2 minutes back in case of special category states if there is a taxable turnover then registration is required if turnover is more than 10 lakhs but if there is no taxable turnover in special category states then limit is not going to be 10 limit is still going to be 20 lakhs so going back to my example which i told 2 minutes back that is about your 14 lakhs of turnover in telangana state 4 lakhs of turnover in our sikkim state in that case registration is not required because we have not crossed 20 lakhs so this is only a sample of what kind of questions can come in the exam this looks so simple to understand you know in the exam when we start looking at the question our mindset so easily says all right come on your 18 lakhs limit is crossed let's write in the exam that registration required but the fact is that registration not required because there is no taxable turnover in sikkim state so my dear friends so these kind of small small areas are there where we tend to slip down in the exam and answer something differently where we tend to lose marks so this looks like a very small thing but just imagine the similar things comes in the exam and you're answering it differently it makes a difference because i keep saying to the students every time that every answer what you write will make a difference in your mark and it's not one mark it's your six months which make a difference in your life so every mark is so very important my dear friends just make sure that these small small areas which are there you have to be very very clear and careful yeah so that's about your registration topic where you need to be very focused on about that 20 lakhs and 10 lakhs parameter at the same time i'm sure most of us know here about the concept of distinct persons and all there is a word called distinct person which is so unique in gst law which says that just gst registration is required to be taken in every state and gst registration is on pan based gst number is based on pan we always say based on pan because gst code is a 15 digit alpha numeric code where in the first two are numbers which means the state code for example telangana has 36 andhra pradesh has 37 kerala has 32 that is every state has a 
Don't try to remember the state codes, guys. Come on, we are all writing exam of Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Come on, don't try to remember the state codes as such. But we need to know the sequence and pattern how GST number looks, wherein the first two digits, the first two numbers, basically represent the state code, and next ten are your PAN. Then we have number one or number two or number three depends upon number of registration you take in a state, and then the next one is a Z, which is directly fixed. This is directly fixed and last we have a check digit which could be a number or it could be an alphabet. So effectively it is a 15 digit alpha numeric code. Generally every person has only one pan. Of course it's only one pan is mandatory. You can't have more than one pan also. That's very clear because direct tax law clearly says that you can't have more than one pan. Exactly. So direct tax law clearly says that you should not have more than one pan. Statement as per 113 a of income tax I you should have only one pan. You can't have more than one pan as such. So for that reason, my dear friends, when you have one single pan, but interesting point the GST is you can have more than one GST number with one pan itself, based on some concept known as business verticals. What does this word business vertical basically mean? So take an example like this: Shivateja is basically into one business of let us say for a second uh, trading in automobiles, and I start one more business trading in textiles. So trading in textiles is a altogether different business compared to trading in automobiles. So I started a second set of business. For that, I can start doing business with a different GST number. Even though GST number is different, my PAN remains stagnant because my ten numbers after my two digits are of course PAN, which remains stagnant. But that next number which I told one will then now become two as such. But PAN number is stagnant. PAN number is of course stagnant because it's all based on your PAN. But tell me, my dear friends, even though my PAN number is stagnant, because my GST numbers are different, and because those two are business verticals, they are treated as distinct persons under GST law. And the moment I say distinct persons, some great point you need to get is that distinct person does not just cover this concept. For example, there is a Karachi bakery, Karachi bakery in Hyderabad. Karachi bakery in Hyderabad decided to open a branch in Bangalore. Karachi bakery, Bangalore, and they open a branch. In Bangalore. Now tell me, guys, when they open Karachi Bakery in Bangalore, they need to take one more registration of GST in Karnataka, because GST registration is state-based registration and required to take state-wise registration. And when they require to take state-wise registration, you have a registration in Telangana, you have a registration also in Karnataka. But PAN number is of course the same. PAN number is of course the same. But even though your PAN number is same, both are deemed to be distinct persons. And what does this difference makes when I say they are distinct persons? The difference where it comes is something like this: where there is one statement in our CGST Act, there is one Schedule One, and also dealt by your Section Seven One C, which clearly says that activities or transactions which are regarded as supply, even though there is no consideration. Generally, we always say it is supply when there is some consideration in the transaction involved. But there are some transactions where it's regarded as supply, even though there is no consideration. So even though there is no consideration, still I call it as a supply. So for that reason, take an example like this: that there is a supply of biscuits. I repeat again, there is supply of biscuits from Hyderabad to Bangalore. That is Hyderabad Karachi Bakery has supplied biscuits from Hyderabad Karachi Bakery to Bangalore Karachi Bakery. Both of them bear two different GST numbers. When both of them bear two different GST numbers, and even though there is no consideration charged, I repeat again, even though there is no consideration charged, still it is regarded as supply. So these are the effective areas where it makes a difference in terms of what exactly supply means and what exactly it makes in terms of registration and all. Yeah, and uh, let's break the concept for two minutes and let me get back to the lovely questions what our students are asking and let me look at the questions what our students have asked. Yeah, just a second, guys. Yeah, well, good to see a lot of number of students participating in the discussions, guys. Feel free to ask any of your questions. Let's keep answering them. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, we have good evening message from so many students. Good evening, guys. Very good evening. Very good evening. And uh, some of them are asking for important topics. Hi, Shaman. I'm here to discuss important topics with you guys. And of course, as I told you already, there are five six crux areas in your basically five six crux areas in your GST law, like your supply. Value of supply and also place of supply, registration and input tax credit. But of course, Shavan, if you are an IPSC student, place of supply is not there for your syllabus. 
And even in your valuation also, your valuation rules like your rule 27 to 35 is not there in your syllabus. CFN level has a concept known as valuation rules where they need to learn about valuation rules about money changing, air travel agent, life insurance. There are some very good valuation rules which you need to learn in CFN level. But IPC there is no valuation rule my dear friend. So Shavani for an IPC student, you can just leave that valuation part for your understanding and learning. But of course you need to learn your section 15 valuation which is very very important where you have concept like in valuation what you need to add and what you need to reduce something like your you need to add your anything which supplier incurs on behalf of the recipient anything charged by the supplier at the same time you also include whatever supplier has collected any taxes duties says other than the gst taxes we also add subsidies what we get other than subsidy from central government and state government this is all the additions what you do to your value of supply at the same time we also reduce something from value of supply that is only one thing which is dealt by section 15.3 that is your discount but there are two types of discount, my dear friend uh, Shavan, that is one discount which is given in the invoice itself. Other kind of discount is what is given after supply is done, but there is agreement at the time when supply is being done. It's something like, you know, I send some goods to you and we have an arrangement and agreement wherein I tell you that tomorrow if the agreement is fulfilled on the stock what I have sent you now, I'll give you discount at subsequent date. This discount can also be reduced. That is discount given after supply is done. But a condition is very clear that agreement should be there at the time when supply is done. If that is dealt, my dear friend, then you can happily reduce your discount from this valuation of supply. Happily you can do that. But valuation rules are not there for your syllabus, my dear friend, uh, if you're IPS a student. And Shavan, of course, if you're a CFR student, you need to do that very clearly. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Amir, how are you? Very good evening. Hi, Ravali. Uh, one more question from Badiraj. How to get equipped with strong fundamental loss of GST? My dear friend Madhuraj, uh, as I told you some time back that the focus and essence of GST law lies in something like how government has streamlined this GST in terms of bringing GST into light and how they have framed this concept of IGST and intrastate supply, intrastate supply, where in intrastate supply we charge something called CGST and SGST, intrastate supply we charge something called IGST. But it's very very important and informative and also imperative to get a clarity as to what is intrastate supply and what is intrastate supply. I feel so sad when a student comes back to me and tell, sir, if supplier is in a different place, recipient is in a different place, it is called intrastate supply. If both are in the same place, it is called intrastate supply, different place, it is called intrastate supply. My dear friend, I am so sorry to tell you, but that's a wrong answer, my dear friends. As per our rules of our IGST Act, intrastate supply clearly refers to where a place, if the location of supplier, and place of supply both are in a different state we call it as intrastate supply and if location of supplier and place of supply both are in same state we call it as intrastate supply and intrastate supply of course we charge CGST, SGST and intrastate supply we charge IGST and I'm sure my dear friend Madhuraj you have you are, I'm sure that you guys are clear with this concept what you need to know about our utilization of the credits that's your input IGST can be used for output IGST, CGST, SGST and input CGST can be used for output CGST and IGST and input SGST can be used for input SGST and output input SGST can be used for output SGST and output IGST but we can't use SG for CG we can't use CG for SG that cross relation is not allowed in GST laws that's very very important point which you need to focus upon this looks like a small thing but really really important guys because that's so very important a question can come up in the exam how can the question come for two marks take an example like this Mr. X has a balance of 10 lakh rupees under IGST in electronic cash ledger. I repeat again. Mr. X has a balance of 10 lakh rupees in electronic cash ledger. Can he use it for CGST? What our mind automatically says. Are man, IGST, come on. Use it for IGST, then for CGST, then for SGST. It's so simple and so wonderful to say. But the answer is wrong. For a small reason because if you clearly observe my question what I asked, I told the balance is in electronic cash ledger. I never told the balance is in credit ledger. That's really, really important. If there is a balance of input IGST, when I say input, I'm referring to what? Credit. If it's a credit, use it for IG, CG, SG. But if the balance is in electronic cash ledger, we are going to use only for that particular specific purpose, but not for anything else. So these are some wonderful, lovely basics what you need to get. And with regards to complete your question further, my dear friend, uh, you need to equip yourself with more fundamental laws about GST. 
We have some lovely books released by ICI where you to look at it. And if you're asking from a practical standpoint, I always recommend you to guide you, you to go through our practical ICI website, look at all notifications, circulars, everything. And if really looking from an examination standpoint, you can always refer to your materials, modules given by your faculties. At the same time, look at your ICI book. And of course, anytime available too, at the end of the session, I'll comment my mail ID also. You can feel free to drop any message what you have so that I can clarify any of your doubts what you have. Yeah, thank you so much, Badiraj. Next. Moving on next, we have a question from Shivanand. That is, how to prioritize the topics the day before the exam? Uh, Shivanand, as I told you already, we have some six, seven important topics which are really, really important where the focus is going to be very, very high. That's your time of supply, place of supply, value of supply, registration and input tax credit. These five are very, very important areas. So do that really effectively and that will serve your purpose. Thank you. And there's a question from Venki. Oh yeah, I know this guy. Should we have to write a separate booklet? Venki, I'm sure you know that uh, IPC, yeah, I'm sure you're an IPC student, Venki. I'm sure you know that ICA has changed the pattern that they have given separate papers and separate question papers that is part A and part B for direct tax, indirect tax. And if you are in old syllabus, Venki, you are going to have 50 marks GST. So this 50 marks will be given separate booklet. So make sure that you write in separate booklet and do really well, Venki. All the very best. Next. Moving on to the next question, we have a question from Chaitanya. That is, he is asking a question about what is the difference between last term identity paper and this attempt GST paper. Are you my dear friend Chaitanya? It's a crazy question what you are asking. Yeah, please. Um, let me tell you Chaitanya, there is a very big amount of difference in terms of what was the last term paper and this paper. The pattern is going to be the same in terms of the type of pattern. If you are a CFR student, let me tell you that the first question comes for 20 marks. And then you are going to have 16 marks, 6 questions where you need to answer any of the 5 questions. And 16 5 turns out to be 80. And plus 20 marks is 100 marks. Plus 16 questions will have 6 questions. And one will be given as choice to you where you can feel free to take the choice. And if you are an IP student, my dear friend, old syllabus you will get for 50 marks. Wherein the first question will be for 10 marks, which is a mandatory question. Then you have 8 marks, 6 question. You need to answer any 5 questions, which is 8 into 5 questions will be your 40 marks and 40 plus 10 turns out to be your 50 marks. So that's how the paper pattern is going to work. But being a new thing for GST and GST law is quite new and a lot of new things have come up and a lot of things are taking shape and a lot of development is happening on a daily basis. What we are expecting is that um, 8 marks question, there will be few 8 marks question and also at the same time this 8 marks will be split into 4 and 4 or 2 into 4. There is definitely going to split in terms of marks where they will be focused on every topic as such. And IPC level we also have topics like uh, tax invoice, debit note, credit note and the time limits for returns. And let me tell you my dear friends there are some 5-6 important topics which I told uh, some time back. There is one more very important topic also known as returns where you need to know very clearly about the concept of returns. How do we do the linking process and time limits and all. After some time, I just spent a little bit of time on returns also. A very, very important area which is so very effective and important in terms of exam too. Yeah. Thank you, Chaitanya. Still anything else, you can just feel free to post. Yeah. Next. Moving on. We have a question from... Uh, we have a question from Shivanand. Yeah, he's talk, yeah, last question was from Chaitanya Kalma Kuntla. Chaitanya, that was the answer for you. We have a question from Shivanand. He's asking about what is the reference material for GST. Your ICI book is fair enough, my dear friend, and uh, do your book of IC, do your book of ICI and also your faculty materials that will be very good for you. That's a good thing for you to do the exam. I think that's fair enough for you to study for the exam point of view. And then we have a question from Sai Madhuri. She's asking about how to prioritize the topics on the day before exam. As I already told my dear friend Madhuri, whatever topics I just told you some time back, which are really, really important, focus and give some utmost importance for these areas because these are the crux of GST law where very good questions of are going to come in the exam where you're going to see some very good questions in the exam. So please do that really effectively. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, moving on. Then we have uh, one more question from our friend Loita. Clarity, correct, uh, she's asking for clarity regarding topics which are deleted from GST module. A uh, very good question, Loita, because this question is there for a lot of students. And uh, let me tell you, Loita, if you're an IPC student, I'm not sure whether you're an IPC student or finance student. If you're an IPC student, you will have yeah, first let me tell you what is not there for IPC and final both. That is something like this. Your rates of GST will not be questioned in the exam. In exam, they are going to directly give the rate in the question and ask you to calculate the tax. Of course, but you need to look at the intrastate, intrastate supply. Intra, make sure that you do charge CGST, SGST, split in the tax rate. Intrastate directly you can charge IGST, but make sure that you split your tax rates. That's always important. Yeah. And um, 
One more topic also got deleted. That's about your TDS and TCS. My dear friend, please don't think about TDS of our income tax. There is something called TDS under GST law also. TCS under GST law also. That is section fifty one, fifty two. That's there in CF and eleven. These topics are also removed for from your syllabus. And they've also removed uh, something like this, friend, uh, which students are slightly confused. We have some lovely concept under GST law known as reverse charge mechanism, which is dealt by section nine three and section nine four. Yeah. Nine three deals with those cases where it is notified RCM. Notified RCM refers to there are some cases where supplier is not liable to pay tax, receiver is liable to pay tax. That is called as notified RCM. And also, we also have something called section nine four, which talks about where supplier is unregistered and receiver is registered. If supplier is unregistered and receiver is registered, we call the transaction as U R D two. We call the transaction as U R D two R D. Even in those cases of U R D two R D, nine four section will apply and reverse charge will apply. But in your nine three, where we are talking about notified R C M, we have for goods, we have for services. Whatever R C M is there for goods, that is removed from syllabus. For both I P C C also. Final also for both of them, RCM in case of goods is completely removed from the syllabus, both for IPC as well as final. But RCM in case of service is there in syllabus, my dear friend. Please don't uh, have a apprehension and a wrong thought that 93 RCM is completely deleted. Let me clarify once again very clearly for everyone's benefit that RCM in case of goods is only deleted, but RCM in case of service is still present in our exam. And to summarize, I'll just take two minutes because at the time of answering the questions, I'm also discussing some good concepts. So please make yourself open and uh, start looking at it because I love this concept of coming live with you guys because for the first time I'm live on this Facebook place. And I always keep telling students that please don't be on Facebook. Please always face the books. But this first time where I'm loving to be on Facebook and spend some time with you guys. So please keep your ears and eyes wide open and keep looking at the concept, guys. Yeah. So when I talk about this area like reverse charge mechanism, which talks about nine three, that is your notified RCM. Nine four is of course supplier unregistered and recipient registered. But nine three talks about notified RCM. When I say notified RCM, this can apply where supplier is registered, receiver is also registered. Still RCM can come. That is is called as notified RCM. This kind of notified RCM is there for goods also, services also. But in case of goods, that concept is deleted from your exam. But RCM in case of services is still there for your exam, where we have some lovely concept like insurance agent to insurance company, recovery agent to bank, director is giving service to a body corporate, and we also have some very good lovely concept like author is giving service to a book publishing company, and music musician is giving service to a music company, and artist artist is giving service to a producer. And we also have some lovely areas like government is giving service to a business entity, and of course lawyer giving service to business entity. Lawyer giving service, my dear friend, they didn't cover C A given to business entity, but they of course covered lawyer giving service to business entity. And we also have some crazy point called sponsorship service given to a body corporate or firm. Even the sponsorship service given to body corporate or firm is also covered in reverse charge mechanism. But you need to get some very good clarity, my dear friends. Take an example like this, uh, I C I. Suddenly, let us say ICI plan to do some cricket match, and they conducted ICI cricket tournament. In the ICI cricket tournament, they asked some people if somebody interested to sponsor, please come and sponsor. Shivadeja told, sir, I'll come and sponsor. I'll make some payment for this. Put my name on the award. Put that. Put their presenter by Shivadeja. Now, tell me, my dear friends, who is giving service to whom? Basically, please don't have a wrong thought on this. Basically, who is giving service to whom? Is ICI is giving service to Shivadeja. Provider is ICI. Receiver is Shivadeja. In this particular case, RCM will not come, even though it is sponsorship, because Shivadeja may be a business entity, but Shivadeja is not a body corporate or firm for RCM to apply. So it's very very important that you need to get that clarity there that RCM in case of sponsorship service will come only when receiver is a body corporate or firm. So that amount of clarity is very very important when it comes to section nine three. And nine four is unregistered to registered where RCM will come, but practically that concept got deferred and postponed. But for exam point of view, there is a possibility that questions can come in the exam. But of course, we have a small exemption that is in a day from all persons. If the supply is up to five thousand rupees from all persons in a single day, that is if I am registered guy, if I take from unregistered person, 
and total together is up to 5,000 rupees in a single day from all persons, then RCM will not apply and 9.4 provision will not hit me and I will not be covered in reverse charge mechanism under section 9.4. That's a lovely concept about 9.4. Then moving on guys, in this flow, let me complete section 9.5 also, which is really, really important. Your 9.5 deals with something called certain notified services through e-commerce operator. E-commerce operator is liable to pay GST. Something like this, where you have only three services. Number one, transportation of passengers by radio, taxi, motor, cab and all. Number two, you have a concept about hotel accommodation. And number three, housekeeping services. But hotel accommodation and housekeeping services, I repeat again. Hotel accommodation and housekeeping services. These two, hotel accommodation and housekeeping, these two, RCM, of course, 95 will come only in a case where hotel accommodation person or housekeeping person is an unregistered guy, only then e commerce operator is liable to pay. But if hotel guy is registered, then hotel guy is required to pay GST. Let me take a small example for this. See, guys, let's say for a second, I log on to a website that is makemytrip.com. And I book a hotel, let's say I book a hotel in Goa. I'm just going for a trip on Goa for relaxation after the classes are over. And I go to Goa for relaxation of classes. When I'm going for a Goa, I booked a room in Goa through Make My Trip app. And the hotel guy is providing a room to room service to me. Now guys, if the hotel guy is a registered guy, I repeat again, hotel guy is a registered guy. In that case, who is required to pay GST is the hotel guy. But by any chance, if the hotel guy is unregistered, then the person liable to pay GST is not the hotel guy, but the e-commerce operator that is none other than your makemytrip.com. So basically they are going to catch hold of this e-commerce operator who is going to be caught in terms of payment of tax. But I'm sure most of us know very clearly that e-commerce operator do not have physical presence in India many a times. So what they told is that my dear e-commerce operator, if you don't have a physical presence in India, will make your representative in India liable to pay tax. But by any chance, if you don't have a representative, please appoint a representative and make him liable to pay tax. There is something really wonderful about your section 9, which talks about levy of GST. So let me move on to some more questions which have popped up from a lot of our friends. I'll keep answering them and get back to some more concepts. Thank you. Well, um, we just answered our question. Yeah. Just a second, guys. I'm here with, with you guys. Two minutes. So, Fanindra is asking about IPC exam. My dear Fanindra, I will keep answering about IPC and final both. Both will go in the momentum. Then, we, we have a question from Pooja. She is asking about, please explain about utilization of input tax credit procedure. My dear friend Pooja, as I told you two minutes back, we have something called I, input IGST, input CGST, input SGST. If you have input IGST, we will use it for output IGST, out next for output CGST, then output SGST. But if you have input CGST, we'll use it for output CGST and output IGST. But input SGST, we'll use it for output SGST and output IGST. But we can't cross utilize CG and SG, SG and CG. That's a very important concept. And I'm sure you're asking a question about input tax credit only, but not about the balance in electronic cash ledger. As I told some time back, if you have a balance in electronic cash ledger, we have to use only for that particular purpose, but not anything other than that. Thank you so much. Then, next we have a question from uh, Bharat. He is asking about, sir, explain about uh, whether takeaway supplies is service or good. A very good question, uh, Bharat. I am sure you are asking about something with related to practicality about uh, asking a question about whether takeaway is service or goods. See, prior to GST also, even in service tax, this was most litigative area, whether in terms of goods or services. And we all know that when you go to restaurant, prior to GST, they used to charge something like this. Prior to just when you used to go to hotel, those guys used to charge something called VAT because there was goods involved and they also charged service tax because service tax department told there is service. So they started charging both service tax also, VAT also, both they have charged prior to GST. But under GST regime, restaurant and catering transactions are deemed to be service. It is very much clarified because of a small reason that we have a lovely section called section 7.1.D which talks about Schedule 2, where they clearly clarified about what are the transactions regarded as supply of goods, what are the transactions regarded as supply of services. In what are the transactions regarded as supply of services, two wonderful things we have told is that one is about works contract, 
One more thing is about restaurant and catering service. These two they clarified it is deemed to be service and GST will be charged accordingly. And I always we always take a stand that even takeaway falls in the same category and GST is being charged at the same rate which is being charged in the restaurant itself. Thank you. Then we have a question from Sai Madhuri. Yes, my dear friend, your question is, uh, sir, please explain the meaning of this with an example. Service provided or grid provided by way of transportation of goods from a place outside India up to stay custom station of clearance in India. Yeah, by a person located in non-taxable territory to a person located in non-taxable to a person located in non-taxable territory. Well, basically, I'm sure you are you are asking a question about your exemption list. Well, uh, Madhuri, let me clarify you very clearly that when we talk about service by way of transportation of goods from by a vessel from a place outside India up to custom station of clearance in India, that's very very clearly important aspect which is covered in our exemption list where it clearly says that see let's say for a second Shivateja is giving service to Madhuri Madhuri wants to get some goods from outside India so basically we all know that this GST law applies to whole of India and including Jammu and Kashmir and India is also defined by GST law by section 256 where they clearly says that India covers territory, territorial waters, continental shelf, exclusive economic zone, soil under the water, airspace about territory and territorial waters. So India definition is so very wide, so very wide. So anything which is being done in India will attract GST law. So for that reason, they also gave some exemption list where they clearly told what are all exempt from GST perspective, where they clearly told, let's say for a second, uh, you are outside India, I'm also outside India, and I'm giving service to you for bringing goods from outside India to India. They have clearly clarified that this kind of transaction will be exempt and they are, going to not, they are not going to charge any GST on this transaction. It's basically a privilege given for bringing goods from outside India till custom station in India. And when I say custom station, there could be a land custom station when you're bringing by land or it could be airport when you're bringing by air or if it's through ship it will definitely be the customs port yeah so that's the answer for your question we should ask you about service provided or to provide by way of transportation of goods from a by vessel from a place outside india up to custom station of clearance in india thank you so much then next we have a question from ravali she asked me about sir it is mandatory to read 31 different rates of CGS to be on interest and supply of services. Well, as I clarified already, it's not required to learn the rate of tax for services. And ICI has clearly clarified in their notification telling very clearly that a student is not required to remember the rates. Rates are not required to remember. They are giving the exam because they want us to more learn more of technical terms than remember the rates of tax. So they want they want us to focus more on the practicality and the concepts involved over there rather than learning the rates for your exam. So please focus and spend some really good time on your learning of the concepts and do some really great learning. All the very best sir. Next, moving on. We have a question from our friend Kiran Kaka. A lovely name, my dear friend. Your question which says that, sir, what are the important negative lists? My dear friend, uh, negative list concept was there in service tax. And if you're asking a question of negative list, where if you're asking about negative list under GST law, GST law does not have any negative list as such. But of course, we have something called Schedule 3, where they clearly told uh, a transaction which is neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service. I repeat again, it has given some transactions which are neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service. If it is not a good, it's not a service, then what is it? It is not a supply only. In which there are only six transactions, my dear friends, where we have a first point like service by, we have a point one like service by employee to employer in the course of employment. And services of funeral, burial, crematorium, mortuary, including transportation of disease. We have service by MPs, MLAs. We have service by court or tribunal. We have concepts like actionable claims other than betting, gambling, lottery. We also have something called sale of land and building, but other than construction services. If I sell a land or a building, we will not tax it, but construction service will definitely be taxable. This is native list. What we have like six points where it's neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of services, which is dealt by your section 7 to A read with your schedule 3. We just want to look back. You can look back to schedule 3 and get your answer. Still in it out, get back, my dear friend. We are there to answer you. Yeah. And my dear friends, let me tell everybody who are there with us online, any queries you have, even after our program is done, feel free to comment. We'll be happy to answer your queries and are available for sure, guys. We're always there for your support. Yeah, this is all for you guys. So feel free to post your queries. And Kiran, I'm sure you got your answer. And if you have a question about exemption list, 
We are exempted list for goods as well as services. For goods is not present in your syllabus, but for services, we have a plethora of list of services which are all exempt, and we have some 70 to 80 points which are all there for your exam. And you need to study all those exemption lists. And of course, don't take effort to remember all those 70, 80 points. Come on, that's too much of discussion and learning. But what you do is make sure that you read those 80 points to twice, thrice, so that you have an idea in the exam. And in exam, questions will come where they might ask some four points and ask whether it is exempt or taxable. One way of asking question. One more way of asking is in an eight marks question, there could be one, two points where they will ask whether it's exempt or taxable. Something like services by RBI when something like hotel accommodation of 1000 rupees or less or services of performing artists in folk or classical art forms of music where the amount charged is not more than 1 1.5 lakh more than 1 1.5 lakh of course taxable and if less than 1 1.5 lakh also taxable in case where you are giving service as a brand ambassador these also taxable so like this we have some crazy points like hospital service we have service of public libraries service of public washrooms we have some so many great points where they are slaughtering of animals, killing animals for food. So, so many things are there in the exemption list which you need to learn. So, do that, do that clearly, Kiran. Wish you all the very best. Do really well. Yeah, next. We have a question from Priyanka. She has a question about, uh, Sir, please clarify the aggregate turnover eligible for composition scheme. A very good question. I was expecting this question too. Well, uh, Priyanka, you are, for answering your question about aggregate turnover for composition scheme, composition D scheme is first of all dealt by your section 10. Section 10 clearly talks about composition scheme where they clearly clarified for your May 2018 exam. I repeat once again for the benefit of all our friends for May 2018 exam, the turnover limit for composition scheme is 1 crore. If the aggregate turnover during preceding financial year, I repeat one more time, if the aggregate turnover during preceding financial year does not exceed 1 crore, then current year you can go for composition scheme provided current year you don't cross one crore but the current year the day you cross one crore you are straight away out of composition scheme and you need to follow a normal scheme and i'm sure most of us know the difference that if you are in composition scheme you file returns on a quarterly basis you'll also pay tax also on quarterly basis you file return in gstr 4 that i'm sure everybody knows here and uh, for special category states uh, the turnover limit is not 1 crore, turnover limit is 75 lakhs. Generally, the turnover limit is 1 crore, but turnover limit for special category states is 75 lakhs. So that's an important point. You need to make a note of it. And really, really important, my dear friend, do really well. And uh, there is a high prospect that a question will come on the composition scheme. Everybody, I'm sure we are clear with that. And let me add a little bit more concept on composition scheme before I get back to next questions. Others, friends, two minutes. Let me complete that concept and get back to you guys. Yeah. In this particular composition scheme, my dear friends, there is composition scheme is applicable for manufacturers, number two, for traders, number three, for restaurant service providers. Any other service provider cannot go for composition scheme. Now, let me tell you the rate of tax under composition scheme applicable for, I repeat again, my dear friends, applicable for May 2018 exam. That is manufacturers 1% plus 1%, effectively 2%. Traders, 0.5% plus 0.5%, effectively 1%. Number three, service providers, that is only restaurant. No other service providers can enter into composition scheme except restaurant guys. That is 2 and a half plus 2 and a half, effectively 5%. And please don't get a doubt in your mind, what if there is IGST? IGST cannot come because a composition scheme dealer cannot, cannot engage in interstate supply. Composition scheme dealer can buy from other state, but he can't sell to other state. And let me change my statement. He can't supply to other state. He can't supply to other state. That is very clear that composition scheme dealer can take from other state, but he can't give it to other state. And he can't take tax from the buyers and he cannot issue a tax invoice. He has to give a document called bill of supply. That's an important thing. And the rates what I've told is applicable for May 2018 exam. And some manufacturers, even though turnover is not more than 1 crore, cannot go for composition scheme. Something like pan masala, tobacco guys. One more thing is ice cream. I know we all love ice cream, but even though you love ice creams, you cannot go for composition scheme, my dear friends. Ice cream is so wonderful. Whether you say cream stone or oso stone or any stone, whatever it is, you cannot go for composition scheme. Because ice cream people, whether or not containing cocoa, that is cocoa, a chocolate thing which we love the most, 
ice cream the moment you are manufacture of ice cream you cannot go for composition scheme so these are areas where question can come in exam on composition scheme which is really really important yeah i'm sure uh, your question is answered my dear friend uh, with regard to composition scheme thank you priyanka all the best then kiran i'm sure i already answered you about the studying of the negative list then we have a question from priyanka hi priyanka hope you are doing really well uh, priyanka's question is clear can we have a brief discussion on advance received against supply of goods why not we'll do that we're always there for you yeah so let me clarify something really interesting and i'm sure uh, she is talking about some lovely concept that's about time of supply time of supply is being dealt by section 12 section 13 section 14 of cgst act section 12 deals with goods 13 deals with services let's talk about 13 14 slightly later because our question of priyanka is on section 12 which talks about time of supply in case of goods when i talk about in case of goods generally the time of supply is date of invoice or date of payment whichever is earliest i repeat one more time my dear friends that is date of invoice or date of payment whichever is earlier but 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 for may 2018 exam there is some lovely point which is applicable which is also given the statutory update that is if last year turnover i repeat one more time a very important point kindly please focus my dear friends if the last year turnover does not exceed 1.5 crores i repeat again if the last year turnover does not exceed 1.5 crores then your answer is not going to be date of invoice date of whichever is earlier the answer is directly going to be date of invoice that means why even though payment has come before invoice we are not going to take the payment date we are still going to take invoice date that is where your priyanka your question of what you are asking about advance received against supply of goods so let's say shivateja is supplying goods to you and i have got some payment in advance invoice is given subsequently even though payment has come i am still not required to pay gst till the time i give invoice to you and i am definitely required to give you invoice where there is moment of goods at the time of delivery and if there is no moment of goods at the time of making it available i need to give the invoice to you that time i am definitely required to pay gst but at the time when advance comes to me in advance comes to me in the form of payment before the invoice i am not required to pay gst if and only if last year turnover of shivadeja does not exceed 1 and 1/2 crore in fact on 15th november 2017 the limit of 1 and 1/2 crore is also removed that is for everybody the answer is date of invoice but the 15th november point is not applicable for may exam because for may exam notification still 30th of october of course 31st of october is applicable for exam so for that reason this particular point about 1 and 1/2 crore is only applicable for may exam but not for november exam for november exam answer is directly date of invoice but for may exam i'll repeat for the last time priyanka the answer is straight simple that date of invoice date of payment whichever is earlier but if last year turnover does not exceed 1 and 1/2 crore the answer is definitely going to be date of invoice that's your answer thank you so much yeah i'm sure priyanka got the answer there's a reply from priyanka too thank you well uh, moving on guys let me get back to the some more content before i get back to answering our other friends too well we have some more uh, wonderful topic known as input tax credit which is really really important my dear friends and input tax credit we have some crazy section called uh, section 175 which is again really really important which talks about the items on which we can't take credit otherwise the items which are ineligible for credit that is also really really important which you need to focus upon something like motor vehicle on which we can't take credit but of course we can take credit when motor vehicle we buy for transportation of goods or motor vehicle we buy for transporting passengers that means my business is transporting passengers or i buy a motor vehicle to sell a motor vehicle these areas i can take credit and we can't take credit in case of membership of a club and health and fitness center we can't take credit when i buy some items which i give as a gift or a free sample there also i can't take credit and i can't take credit on the gst what i pay on life insurance and health insurance and i also can't take credit when it comes to some lovely area like with regard to construction inputs that means what it's an important area my dear friends let me reiterate and clarify that point let's say shivadeep is constructing office i just want to set up my a new ca office and i am taking some inputs like cement sand steel and constructing my ca office see actually speaking it is ca office man come on it's a professional thing it's a it's absolutely my professional thing related to my business or profession i am constructing my office but still i can't take credit 
for a small reason because under 17 5 there is something called construction inputs what you buy on your own account you can't take credit but a Shivateja would have been a real estate developer where I construct a building to sell that building happily I can take credit but in normal case I really can't take credit so that's an important point where question can come up in the exam which you need to focus upon something really really important my dear friend yeah so these areas are there which are really important with relation to cases where input tax credit cannot be taken which is dealt by section 17 5 which is very very important and my dear friends we also have a lovely section an important section called section 18 which talks about something like availability of credit in some special circumstance this topic is common for both IPC and final special circumstance where we have some lovely areas like we are shifting from composition to normal or we are something like our product which was exempt has now become taxable or so far I was not registered now only I got registered or I have taken some wallet registration we all know that unless we are registered we can't take input tax credit and if we are in composition scheme also we can't take credit but law clearly told that if you shift from composition scheme to normal scheme you will end up paying tax on monthly basis file returns on monthly basis but law told the moment you shift from composition scheme to regular scheme they clearly told that whatever stock which you have which are there with you either in your work in progress or in your finished goods on all those things and also on the capital goods happily take your credit but on capital goods directly don't take full credit whatever whatever tax you have paid at the time of purchase of capital good that you take reduce it by 5% per quarter or part thereof balance you can happily take it as a credit and this credit of capital goods is allowed only in two cases that is your shifting from composition to normal or exempted good became taxable but if it's a case of new registration or a case of voluntary registration still you get a credit on the inputs but you don't get a credit on capital goods small areas but really really important please do focus upon yeah that's about your input tax credit which is really really important and CFNS students please make sure that you guys also focus on your section 19, 20, 21 which talks about 19 about your job work where credit can be taken but if you send some inputs to your job worker make sure that we get back that within one year capital goods we need to get back within three years if we are not done then whatever credit has been taken will definitely be reversed that's an important point which you need to make a note of CFNS students and we also have a concept called 2021 that is about your ISD input service distributor wherein ISD is somebody who has a credit of tax paid on input services which he keeps on distributing towards respective branches who is holding the same PAN number but of course GST number is different that's where you keep distributing your credits that's also allowed but if excess credit is distributed that will definitely be recovered that's dealt by section 21 so please make sure that you guys focus a lot on input tax credit a very wonderful and important area my dear friends so please do that yeah so that's what your input tax credit topic my dear friends and then moving on let me take two minutes of your time on uh, discussion about one lovely area which talks about something like this which is something so unique and wonderful about place of supply I please students just close your eyes because this topic is only for CFN students you can also hear for your understanding and learning but for exam point of view this place of supply is only for CFN students my dear friends place of supply is being dealt by your section 10, 11, 12, 13 of IGST Act of course wherein section 10 and 11 is for goods 12, 13 is for services there is definitely going to be some very good importance for place of supply in the exam and I foresee that definitely questions will come in exam for 8 marks at least from place of supply which is a really really important topic please make sure that you guys do really well where we are trying to determine what is going to be the place of supply and which state we will regard as place of supply and it's really really important that we determine the correct state because of a small reason that because of a small reason that this state is going to make a difference because GST is a destination based consumption tax what tax? destination based consumption tax otherwise the place where goods are consumed that state is going to get the entire credit I repeat again the state where goods are consumed that state is the state where entire credit is going to come the state where goods are consumed will get the entire credit not the place where goods are being sent from that clearly signifies that if I send goods from Hyderabad to Visa the tax will go to Andhra Pradesh state but not to Hyderabad state so it's a very very important point which you need to make a note of so that's important thing which you need to be very clear about what is place of supply because the wrong state will get the money if the wrong, if there's a place of supply is determined wrong so it's very important the place of supply is determined very right for allocation of credits that is where I'm sure most of you guys here know that GST was debated very much 
were debited by many states which are manufacturing because they are going to lose revenue because GST money is going to reach the state where goods and services are being consumed. For that reason, government introduced a concept called GST compensation cess, where the money is being paid and government is starting some cess on few products like aerator waters, motor vehicles and all and that money is being given to the states which have lost money because of GST. So it's a very important topic, my dear CFN students, please do that really, really well. That's about your place of supply. So do that really well, my dear friends. Then moving on guys, we have some uh, interesting area called GST returns. That's about GSTR 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, and few returns are relevant only for IPC students. And every return is relevant for CFN student. Of course, subject to the return for GSTR 7 and 8, that is TDS, TCS, which is not there for your exam. GSTR 1, 2, 3, make sure that you learn the matching concept very clearly about GSTR 1 auto populating in 2A, GSTR 2 auto populating in 1A, which is really, really important. And GSTR 3 is monthly return. And please make sure that you guys will focus on the late fee, what you are required to pay. And something really important about late fee is different for annual return, different for normal return. For normal return, the late fee is different. And for annual return, the late fee is different. Please make sure that you guys will focus on that. That's very, very important. Yeah, so please do that. Returns topic very clear and very, very important. And for composition dealers, it's on a quarterly basis. And for normal dealers, they file GSTR 1 by 10th and 2 by 15th, 3 by 20th. As for the law, of course, practically things are being different because GST is still picking up and things are going in a different way. But exam, please do write the dates of 10, 15 and 20 by difference. Yeah, so please do that effectively and properly. Yeah, and... Um, we also have some returns, some special returns like GSTR 9, which is annual return. GSTR 9 is annual return in normal cases. And GSTR 9A is annual return for composition scheme dealers, which needs to be filed by 31st of December of subsequent financial year. That means what? See, for example, 1718 return should be filed by 31st of December 2018, annual return. Formats are all is still in pipeline, which will come very soon in a detailed manner. GSTR 9 format is released, but GST law also has a concept called GST audit when turnover is more than 2 crores. A very good area where if turnover is more than 2 crores, there is something called GST audit. So we chartered accountants are going to have some good work and we need to prepare some reconciliation statement which we need to attach with our GSTR 9 and submit to the department. So it's a really, really important area. So guys, um, let me get back to few more questions which our friends are having and let me answer that questions first before getting on to some other topic. Yeah. Thank you guys. Well, we have a question from Funny. His question is, on which areas ICI stress more in question paper? I mean, theory or practical? Uh, funny, if you're asking a question, what will ICI stress on? It's difficult for me to answer because ultimately it's ICI. I cannot predict that properly, but I can definitely tell you which areas you need to focus upon, which is important, but I can't definitely tell you what will ICI ask. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. So what you need to focus upon is very clearly. I am presuming that Funny is an IPC student. If you're an IPC student, my dear friend, for you, Input tax credit is very important. Definitely a question will come. Valuation is very important. A question will come for sure. And a question will come even on supply also, section 7, which is an important area. And when I say question will come, I'm not telling it will come. There's a high prospects questions will come for a small reason because it's unpredictable. I cannot predict exactly what is going to come. But of course, out of my experience of past training of students and experience on GST and all, I can definitely tell you what kind of focus will be there in the exam. So input tax and good questions will come, valuation good questions will come, you will also have good questions on tax invoice also, where you have a small point of your 200 rupees, a hey, lovely point, yeah, come on funny, let me clarify that 200 rupees point what you asked just now. If we do a supply to a registered person, it is mandatory that we give an invoice. But if we do a supply to a unregistered person and the value of supply is less than 200, I repeat one more time, if we do a supply to an unregistered guy and the value of supply is less than 200 and such unregistered guy is not asking for an invoice, in that case, I need not give an invoice to him. I can only make a consolidated invoice at the end of the day, which is for my records. And this concept will work only in a case where I do a supply to an unregistered person and he is not asking an invoice and the value of supply is less than 200. But if value of supply is more than 200, invoice is mandatory. If receiver is registered, invoice is mandatory. Receiver is unregistered and is asking the invoice, still invoice is mandatory. So this can be a small, small area where question can come. Looks pretty small, but very powerful. So please be very sure on what you're writing in the exam. Okay, all the very best. Then moving on guys, we have one more question from our friend. Let me answer that. We have a question from Vishwanath. Hi Vishwanath, hope you are doing really well. You have a question uh, 
could explain about pot rules under GST? Is there a difference between pot as per service tax and GST? First of all, uh, under GST law, we don't call it as a pot rules because earlier prior to GST, that is service tax, we used to call it as point of taxation rules. But under GST rules, we call it as time of supply. But Vishwanath, I'm sure you know that uh, that point of taxation was only for services. And here in GST, we have something called time of supply where we have for goods also, where we have for services also. Service, very similar to what you have learnt in service tax, that is, if invoice is raised within 30 days, date of invoice, date of payment, whichever is earlier, and for banking, 45 days. And if it is not raised within 30 or 45 days, it will be date of service, date of payment, whichever is earlier. These things are very similar to what you learnt in your point of taxation in service tax. So very similar point. But we also have some important point like time of supply for goods, as I told sometime back about your date of invoice, date of payment, but some special point about one and a half crore too. So that's an important area what you need to focus upon with relation to time of supply. I'm sure your question is answered, my dear Vishwa. All the very, very best. Do really well. Yeah. So that's about our question from our friends. And uh, let me get back to the questions after some time. And let's talk with you guys on one more interesting area. Yeah. So, well, uh, I have spent some time with you guys on discussion about time of supply. I spent a little bit time on about discussion about the valuation part and return parts too. And uh, CFNS students, please do focus upon the valuation part. That's about your 27 to 35 rules, which is very, very important. High prospects equation can come in the exam from valuation rules, especially the money changing part or life insurance agent part. Or a question can definitely pop up from second hand goods, which is very, very important. And one crazy concept called OIDER, online information, database access and retrieval services, a very, very important concept. Do that really well. CFNS students, that's not there for IPCC guys, but for CFNS students, the OIDER and all is very, very important. So please do that really well. And next two minutes for CFNS students, CFNL guys, please do really focus on the miscellaneous provisions too and spend some really good time on appeals and revisions where we have some appeals, very good points like when we go for appeal before uh, appellate authority or we go for appellate tribunal where we have a concept like pre-deposits for appellate authority we have something called 10% pre-deposit appellate tribunal we have something called 20% pre-deposit these are all small, small areas but they will be definitely high focus in the exam so do that really well and CFN students you also have a prospects that questions will come on transitional provisions where they are definitely going to ask you about what will happen and uh, how do we how do we have done the smooth transition from the old law to GST law where whatever credits we have on the stock left out on 30th June how we have taken the credit and how do we file the tran 1 form and how do we take that credit so high prospects question will come on these areas too so please do that really really well and that's very very important my dear friend yeah and CFNS students, you also need to focus about something called known as refunds. And please also do something called advanced ruling, an important area. And a question can come something called liability in special cases where we talk about something called transfer of business, amalgamation, liquidation and all, where who is liable to pay GST when liquidation happens, how do the liquidator inform to the department, how will the department charge and collect the GST. So some important areas are there which are very, very important. So please do that really, really well. So these are the major important areas for CFNS students too, which you need to focus upon. And IPC guys, your syllabus itself is short in terms of the basics, in terms of charge of GST, which I told you sometime back, in terms of section 7, supply, but do that clearly about schedule 1, where I told about transaction regarded as supply, even though there is no consideration. And one more topic called valuation, one more topic called time of supply, and do some important topic about tax invoice, debit note, credit note. And let me take two minutes of your time on discussion about debit note, credit note. Debit note, credit note is totally different in GST, my dear friends. Debit note is a document given by supplier. Credit note also is a document given by supplier. Credit note is given in case where the goods are returned or in case where value of supply needs to come down. But if the value of supply is increased, we give something called debit note, which is also known as a supplementary invoice. And the details of debit note should be shown in the same month return in which we are issued. But if it is credit note, you can show in the same month or you can show in the subsequent month. But not later than return for September month of next financial year or date of filing annual return, whichever is earlier. This has been dealt by your section 34 concept of debit note and credit note. That's also very, very important. So my dear friends, IPC students and finance students, you guys have some very good uh, common topics. So do that really, really well. CFNS students, you also have extra topics. 
and good thing is that we don't have any case laws as of now because GST is a quite a new subject. So please make sure that you guys get some really really good scores and aim for great marks and just aim for exemption guys just don't aim for 40s 50s we are all such lovely talented students so please do aim for 70s and 80s and get some wonderful scores and all the very very best my dear friends do keep rocking uh, before I close and uh, th thank you guys they have a question from our friend Apurva I'll clarify that and then move on hi sir what is the order for credit availability uh, Apurva as I told you already that um, credit availability we have IGST, CGST, SGST will utilize in the manner which is given by section 49.5 where you use our IGST for CGST and all but you can use that credit but you can't cross utilize the CGST, SGST part that's the only thing what you need to be focused upon but of course IGST is so user friendly you can use it for IG, CG, SG CG used for CG and IG and uh, SG used for SG and IG but don't use CG for SG and SG for CG yeah so please be very clear about it and for order for credit availability, if you have a credit of IG and CG also, if you have IG and CG also, and output is CG, better use CG first, no? Because IG becomes more user friendly for IG, CG, SG. So if you have output CG, SG, input you have IG also, CG also. Anything you can use, but we prefer always to use CG because IG is more user friendly, so use CG first. Yes, that's an important point. Yeah? And then uh, I'm sure you are clear, Apuru, all the very best. And we have one more question from Kishore. Let me clarify the questions first. That is by what amendment uh, GST came 101st or 121st? It is actually both things because 101st, 101st, 101 or 101st amendment act is the point where GST has come into light and 121st amendment act is the point where lot of new rules and provisions has come into light and that they have done for a small reason because uh, GST requires some special constitutional amendment because GST is such a tax where it is interstate supply CGST, SGST will be charged and both center and state together are taking tax. See, we always had some taxes before which center was taking, taxes before which state was taking. For the first time, we have a tax where center and state together are taking the tax. So that's a great tax which you need to understand. For that reason, constitution was required to be amended for GST to be brought to light. So I'm sure, Kishore, you are clear with this point. Yeah? Thank you so much, my dear friends. Uh, I had a lovely time with all of you guys. And you can keep posting still your queries if you have any. And I'll be answering your queries for sure. I'll come back once again uh, live with you guys on discussion about some more wonderful points. And at the same time, any queries what you have, please do comment. I'll comment back the answers for you. And my mail ID is tshivateja at gmail.com. Any queries you have, you can mail it to me. I'll reply for sure. At the same time, you can stay connected to our Goldman CA page. They're all our lovely, wonderful students, very aspirant in terms of learning things. So you can just connect it to them. And any doubts you have, you can feel free to get back to me. I will be always happy to answer all your queries, my dear friends, and help you to reach your success. Because I'm somebody who always believes that your success is our success. Because it could be yours, but for me it could be, it is always our success. So please do really well, work really hard, my dear friends. Thank you so much for the opportunity given and uh, spending some lovely time with you and participating in the discussion with some lovely questions and discussion about some crazy points and different points. And I'm glad that students had different queries. And a special thanks to the entire Goldman CA team, our entire Goldman CA team of Telugu, Hindi, English, all the languages for all your kind support of sharing everybody and reaching all for the student benefit. It's a great thing what you're doing. Thank you so very much to all my lovely, lovely students and all the friends who have been a part of this. At the same time, to also our Goldman CA team for giving this opportunity to spend time with you guys. I'll definitely come back to you guys and spend some very good time. Uh, well, I like to leave, but uh, we have one more question from Jay. So let me answer that. Hi, Jay. How are you? I hope you are doing really good. You have a question. What is Dell Credit Agent in agent definition? Well, you would have heard your uh, consignment accounts where you would have learned something called consignor, consignee. This is not about your GST, but uh, consignor, consignee. A lot of time, consignee takes up the responsibility of collection of debts from the customers. Where the consignee takes responsible collection of debts from customer, consignor gives some extra commission to the consignee, which we call it as declaratory commission. So if you are acting as an agent and the principal is there, agent is there, principal and agent, and there is a supply of goods from principal to agent. If there is a supply of goods from principal to agent, it is regarded as supply even though there is no consideration. This is also one point which is covered in Schedule 1. A very good question, Jay, and I'm sure you got your answer with regard to who is a declaratory agent. So whether you are a declaratory agent or any agent, if there is supply of goods from principal to the agent, it is regarded as supply even though there is no consideration because this point is covered in your Schedule 1 read with your Section 7.1c. 
Thank you so much, my dear friends, and had a great time. Thank you so much. See you all once again. Take care. Bye-bye.